We'll return for the next few minutes now to an issue we've been covering on the show that has now exploded into controversy since we last talked about it. The makeup of the New York State Court of Appeals and Governor Hochul's nominee to be the state's chief judge, Hector LaSalle. No chief judge nominee has ever been defeated in the state Senate confirmation process. This one might. With us now is one of the leading opponents of Hector LaSalle's nomination, Senate Deputy Majority Leader, State Senator for the 12th District from Queens, Michael Janaris. Welcome back, Senator Janaris. Always good to have you. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for having me. And Hector LaSalle is not a name the public has heard before for the most part. He would be the first Latino chief judge, and he's supported by prominent Latino progressive Democrats like Melissa Mark Viverito and Fernando Ferrer. What's wrong with Hector LaSalle? Well, first of all, let me just clarify. He's also opposed by numerous progressive Latino Democrats, including Uh, multiple members of the Senate who ultimately have uh, the say on this. Um, But uh, to answer your question, what is wrong is that the Court of Appeals has been um, off for the last several years. Um, Janet DeFiori's tenure, uh, by pretty wide um, uh, uh, understanding, has been... The outgoing chief judge. Right. The the outgoing chief has been uh, deemed by many to be uh, the worst Court of Appeals administration in in modern history. And a number of us are uh, anxious to see the court regain its stature and get back on track. And for me, at least, um, uh, uh, Justice LaSalle seems like more of the same and a continuation. Um, And the the uh, history and his decisions back that up. And so I don't, I don't think this is a close call. Justice LaSalle represents the status quo uh, on this court of appeals. And I, for one, am anxious to see the court um, move in a better direction. I want to ask you about a couple of decisions um, that seem to come up as the most controversial from the progressive side leading to this opposition. Uh, I'm going to invite you to explain them from your perspective, and then I'm going to give you pushback that supporters of LaSalle are offering. One has to do with uh, a case involving um, a, uh, sorry, a, um, a crisis pregnancy center, and the other <clears throat> has to do with a case involving union rights. Can you describe what happened, what he did in the Crisis Pregnancy Center case uh, that contributes to your opposition? Right. I, 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 my understanding is that he joined a decision that restricted the then Attorney General's ability to properly investigate um, uh, that, that pro-life uh, center. Um, and restricted the ability to bring proper enforcement for it um, operating fraudulently. Um, and uh, I believe the Attorney General's office has indicated that it essentially put a stop to their investigation because they weren't able to obtain the information that, <clears throat> that they were seeking. Um, in the other case, uh, which is uh, why you see such a vast array of important organized labor uh, unions opposing this nomination, um, is uh, that there was a, a union action where one of the union leaders um, commented on the employer, um, and the employer uh, was allowed to sue um, uh, that person for defamation, which creates a tremendous chilling effect on um, labor actions uh, in the workplace. And so you have seen a, a very significant um, opposition coming from the likes of the communication workers, the, uh, 32 BJ. Um, the AFL-CIO has expressed concern about this nomination. And uh, so I, I do want to also um, uh, uh, clarify some of the framing of this. It is not just the progressive left uh, that has concerns here. Um, it is uh, organized labor, the progressive left, um, moderate Democrats within the Senate who have concern about this nomination. Um, and uh, that is why the opposition is so broad-based and, and has created uh, – the situation we're in today. Governor Hochul, knowing that you are coming on today, um, her office sent us a few press clips that are more supportive of Judge LaSalle. On the the labor rights case you were just referring to, which is Cable, cable Vision versus the Communication Workers of America, um, uh, this pushback comes from a New York Law Journal opinion article um, that says the union is framing it as anti-labor, saying LaSalle empowered management to harass 
labor. But they question it. They say, we must question that analysis. LaSalle was one of four justices who signed on to a memorandum opinion by the diverse appellate division panel, one of whom dissented in part, and it says that panel ruled completely in favor of the union and union representatives in their union capacity, but simply held that a defamation claim against union leaders who may have acted in their individual capacity should not be dismissed even before discovery begins. So I know that's a lot of legalese. I guess what what they're saying in his defense is, um, A, it was a Court of Appeals majority ruling. It wasn't just him. So he was in good company on a Democratic appointed body. And also all the ruling was was that somebody could be sued for defamation as an individual, uh, even if the union couldn't in their professional capacity, or at least that case could continue, uh, at least through the discovery process where the facts come out. So that that doesn't sound to this New York Law Journal writer um, like he's some kind of anti-union, you know, union buster. All right. Well, first of all, I'll take the word of the unions uh, to begin with, as opposed to someone who's writing an op-ed, uh, likely at someone's request who's supporting LaSalle. But, um, but the point is, it was a lot of legalese. And to peel that apart, uh, which you have to realize is you're allowing someone to be sued, which then incurs all sorts of burdens uh, uh, of having lawyers, hiring lawyers, producing discovery, giving uh, employers even more ammunition to harass uh, organized labor. Um, and it, it, it actually touches on a broader point, which is important, which is the balance of power uh, in our society is way too often in favor of the wealthy, the big corporations, the employers. Um, and so the last thing we need is a court that's tipping the scales even further in that in that direction. And that's what that decision does. A lot of these decisions, they're obviously close calls or they wouldn't be getting into the appeals courts and the courts of appeals. Um, and so they could tip either way. And what we've seen from uh, Justice LaSalle's record is that they too often tip in the direction of uh, the already powerful. Um, and, uh, and, and I've heard this claim that he's just joined opinions of others and that's where the subject of the critique is. Well, frankly, Brian, that's all we have to go on. In 10 years on the appellate court, uh, Justice LaSalle has only written six opinions, two of which were reversed. So the only the only record we have to go on is uh, those where he is joining majority opinion and signing on to opinions of other uh, other judges. And so that's how we're going to make our judgment. Now, the two cases you mentioned get the bulk of the attention. Um, but there's been an analysis also trying to kind of understand his philosophy in the absence of a broad uh, written record. Um, and so uh, there's been an analysis looking at cases that Justice LaSalle was involved in that ultimately made its way to the Court of Appeals where the court ended up divided um, and looked at where which side he was on in, in those cases. Um, and in seven out of eight cases uh, where that scenario applied, he sided with the conservative bloc, with De Fiore, and Singus, and Canatara and Garcia, the exact group that has um, that has created problems at the court um, and moved it in a direction that many people think is problematic. And so for those of us who want to see a, a change from the tenure of Janet Fiore, Justice LaSalle does not seem like the best choice. Your reaction could have been predicted, probably was predicted, inside the governor's office. Uh, as I mentioned, we've done two previous segments already on the makeup of the Court of Appeals, including one shortly before Christmas that was explicitly about the list of seven potential new chief judges for the state of New York who Governor Hochul was considering. And there were some, including LaSalle, who the groups who, re- you know, who, who you're referring to opposed, and some who they supported, um, so this reaction was entirely predictable and known to the governor as a consequence in advance. Why do you think Governor Hochul chose LaSalle, knowing that this explosion would come? That, that's a question we're all asking, Brian. I don't know the answer to it. It wasn't just those groups, but there were 20 senators who wrote a letter without identifying people we liked or didn't like specifically because we didn't want to um, color the governor's um, 
or restrict the governor's ability to to make her own decisions. But we made it very clear the type of jurist that we would look favorably upon. Um, and so the um, controversy that has arisen from this choice was entirely predictable. Um, and so now here we are. We're not spoiling for a fight with the governor. We're anxious to work with her. Uh, we have worked well with her on so many issues uh, up to this point. But for those of us who feel so strongly that this court um, has been a problem at a time when, because of the U.S. Supreme Court, the state court systems are more important than ever, we can't in good conscience uh, vote to confirm a nominee who we think would not uh, improve the Court of Appeals here in New York. Let me take a question for you from a listener. I think it's an interesting question from Luther in Washington Heights. Luther, you're on WNYC with the State Senate Deputy Majority Leader Michael Janaris of Queens. Hi, Luther. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, my question is this um, to the State Senator. To what extent is your opposition to Judge LaSalle related to the 4-3 to three decision of the Court of Appeals which overturned the redistricting maps that you championed last year. Um, is, is, are these related? Because they certainly appear to be, uh, particularly given the allegations that you and other state Democrats may have overreached in uh, arriving at those maps. Um, the, the answer is not at all. That decision is already made. We are living with the uh, maps drawn by the courts uh, uh, indirectly through the special master. Um, and by the way, the state Senate has returned with a supermajority regardless. So uh, I don't know what Justice LaSalle has to Though do with the that. the Democrats <laughs> lost Congress largely because of the redistricting being thrown out by the um, court well, in New York. Yeah, look, I'm not happy about that decision. I think it was wrong. Justice LaSalle was not involved in that decision. <laughs> so like, I don't know what the connection would otherwise be. What, well, what that's, the, that's the be? relevant answer. He was not involved in that decision. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, there's also a question of due process here, and some of his supporters are saying, wait, you and other members of the Senate are coming out against him before you've held confirmation hearings. Don't you want to hold confirmation hearings, grill him on his record, these cases we've been talking about and others, and hear his version and then come to your conclusion? Uh, well, I'll say a couple of things about that, Brian. First of all, uh, Senator Hoylman, who chairs our Judiciary Committee, has made it clear, of course, we're going to have confirmation hearings. That was always going to be the case. Um, as to the timing of when people form opinions, we do our homework. We, I have read every case that Justice LaSalle has written. I met with Justice LaSalle and talked to him directly and asked questions, and we had a, a good conversation. Um, and so people, just as they do at the federal level, reach their opinions uh, when they feel comfortable that they have drawn a conclusion. Uh, when Amy Coney Barrett was um, uh, was nominated, uh, a number of senators, including the Democratic leader, refused to even meet with her. And they had formed their conclusions and announced their opposition almost immediately upon her nomination. So uh, it is not unusual for people who will ultimately stand in judgment to uh, announce their opinion when they have reached it. I have reached a conclusion, as have over a dozen of my colleagues. Uh, and so it's better for that conversation and that dialogue to happen in public. Should we should we privately know what we're going to do and not tell anybody? Is that what the alternative is? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But um, should this nomination still be put forward uh, in the coming days and weeks, uh, Senator Holman will chair a confirmation hearing and the dialogue will continue through that uh, forum as well. All right. In our last couple of minutes, let me tack on two unrelated questions because you're also – and people who follow politics in New York State already know this, and people who don't follow so closely should know it. A new session of the legislature is beginning for every potential issue for New York under the sun. And I just want to ask you very briefly about two that I wonder if you're going to take up in any way. And one is the ongoing affordable housing crisis in New York. And particularly as it intersects um, with the issue of crime in New York. So many people say, look, whether Mayor Adams is doing the right things in the way he's removing homeless people from the streets and people who appear to have serious mental illness problems from the streets, what we really need is a lot more supportive housing. Is yeah, the legislature going to give us that this year? 
And and that's a priority of mine as well, Brian. So I'm glad you brought it up. The governor has it. She's focused on affordable housing. I and my colleagues have been very focused on it. In fact, there's a program um, uh, called Honda, Housing Our Neighbors with Dignity, that I authored uh, that has money in it to help convert uh, unused hotel space to supportive housing, exactly to create the kind of stock you're talking about. Um, we need to do a lot more of it than we um, uh, have seeded that program with. Uh, but I'm hopeful that as part of the budget process in the next couple of months, we will do a lot more and, and focus on that. It is absolutely necessary and, and a complete priority of mine. Uh, and the other thing I would mention, I don't know if you were going to ask about it or not, but let me put a plug in there, is sure. uh, myself and Assemblymember Mamdani um, here in Astoria also have been uh, talking about uh, really doing what's necessary to get the MTA uh, on its feet financially. Uh, perpetually, uh, not just this Band-Aid approach where they're in a deficit, we give them a couple of bucks to keep them afloat, but not solving the uh, fundamental underlying problem. And we're trying to also um, focus on that to create a robust functioning transit system that's not always begging for money or trying to raise fares every year. And yes, my other question wasn't going to be specifically MTA focused, but we certainly can get there through that because it was going to be potential fiscal crisis focused. I was watching Morning Joe today on MSNBC, progressive television station, um, and they were showing charts reflecting the people who earn a million dollars or more in New York State leaving, like the Republicans say they're leaving, um, at an alarming rate for other states and pointing out that the top 1% of, of earners in New York State pay 40% of the taxes. And if those people leave, it's potentially devastating um, for all kinds of state services, certainly MTA included. Are you concerned about that, and is it something you feel you need to address? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, obviously, we don't want people who uh, form a big part of the tax base to leave the state. Uh, a lot of the data that has recently emerged on that front is looking at pandemic era uh, movement. And obviously in 2020, New York was the middle um, of the national crisis uh, around COVID-19. Uh, and so a lot of people, I think, left as a result of um, the shutdowns and the problems that we were forced to uh, endure um, during that period. So do, do we want them back or those who are here to stay? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and part of that is also we want the working uh, class of New York to stay as well. Uh, and that means providing the services that they need to be able to live in this very expensive uh, city that we have. So uh, it, it is a, a monumental task. And uh, I know we're anxious to roll up our sleeves and get to it. How are you going to get some of those wealthiest people to not be tempted to move to Florida in particular? Well, I, I think dialogue is important, but we also have to realize that they need to be engaged and understand that the services that these these tax monies go to are things that benefit them, their workplaces, their employees, um, and uh, and make it uh, a better place that might want to have them as well as the people around them in the community stay. Uh, and so we need to make New York better. We need to make New York better for um, the people who live here, and that's not just the wealthy people that keep them from leaving, because what's going to happen if you bend over backwards to make sure they don't leave is everybody else is going to leave because they can't afford to live here anymore, mm. or they can't afford mm -hmm. child care, or they can't afford to send their kids to school. So it's mm. important that we continue on the path we started last year of creating a universal child care in this state, making pre-K statewide, doing the things that will um, make New York more desirable and more affordable for everybody. New York State Deputy Majority Leader, New York State Senate Deputy Majority Leader, Michael Janaris of Queens. We always appreciate when you're coming on. I'm glad you came on uh, to talk about the Hector LaSalle nomination and to launch this very important new session of the legislature. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Brian.